Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're looking at something a little bit unusual for this channel, and these are the Young Adventurer's Guides, which are put out for D&D 5e. Uh, normally I'm not a huge fan of 5th edition D&D, but I think these books are really quite a gem. Uh, they're designed for kids, really, not for adults. I'd say ages 8 through 12 or so. Um, and what they do is they introduce kids to the world of Dungeons and Dragons, to the concepts and the tropes, and they really get them thinking about how they would deal with living in a fantasy world and the kinds of choices that they would have to make. Even if you're an adult, I think there's a lot that you can learn from these books in terms of how to design an RPG book, especially for ease of use and reference. There's a lot of things that are done right here that I think in the main D&D books uh, aren't done as well. Before we get started, though, quick shout out to some of our new patrons over on Patreon, including Locke, Nightclub, Bill Jamez, Donald Morton, Robert Franzgard, Bill Lackey, Billy Doherty, uh, Michael Gorsuch, Jason Vines, and Jeff Barrel. Thanks so much for helping to support the channel. All right, let's take a look at these one at a time. There's a lot of material here, so we're not going to go through it in a ton of detail. But let's begin with this monster book right here, Beasts and Behemoths. Uh, there's two monster books. There are two books that are focused on uh, classes and one book focused on dungeons. We're going to briefly look at all of those. Before we get into the material inside, though, um, some information about just the general construction here. These are all hardback books. They're all in digest size and they're really well constructed. Uh, there's a lot of nice touches, too, including this shiny gold foiling around the outside, which is a really great touch. Um, and really looks premium in a way that a lot of other 5e books don't. Um, another unusual thing is that these are all with stitched binding on the inside. You can see stitches holding all the pages in. As we flip through these, you'll see that a lot of them are kind of beaten up because my kids have been using these for about a year or so, and they're pretty rough on them. They've thrown them around the house, they've sat on them, they've bent them the wrong way, and these books have held together. Uh, they are built and stitched and constructed more strongly, more firmly than the official books. So it's kind of amazing that so much effort was put into these little books, which a lot of people don't even know about. Another big feature is that these books, you can get them for like $5 each. I think the official um, price is like $13, but if you buy them online, I'll put links down below, uh, you can get them from anywhere from $10 to $5 each, uh, especially for buying them in a bundle. So they are practically giving these books away, uh, which is kind of amazing. So let's look at what we get here. Beasts and Behemoths. We have a lot of co color art all throughout the whole book. They're all written by Jim Zub. I looked him up. I believe he is a comic book artist or a comic book writer. Um, I haven't really heard of him before, but these are clearly a labor of love for him. Lots of really great, clear design. Uh, the art is pretty good. It's very reminiscent of what we see in the fifth edition books. Um, but it is often simplified down and a little bit more cartoony than we would see otherwise, which I'm not really a fan of. I would have liked more detailed, richer art because kids don't really need the art to be uh, dumbed down or simplified. Um, but it does you know, fairly well for what it does. Um, there are no stats and no rules of any kind throughout the entire book. In, in fact, throughout all of these books. These books are written entirely from an in-world perspective, or almost an in-world perspective. They do tell you how it's a game that you're going to be playing, um, but there's no uh, meta numbers. There's no hit points. There's no armor class. There's no ability scores. It all just describes things as you would see them and as you would experience them if you were there, which is wonderful. And I wish more monster manuals and more D&D books did that. So we have our descriptions of our different types of monsters. The only numbers really are these threat levels, which go from one to five, basically just telling you how dangerous they are. We have pictures of the monsters. We have a size, some swarm powers, a write-up of what they're all about, um, what their layer is like, uh, what to do if you encounter them, what not to do if you encounter them. Excellent. Uh, you don't see this stuff in the main monster manual books. You don't have advice on tactics. Uh, some of the monster manual uh, monsters have barely any description at all when you see them. You just have to sort of figure out what their deal is by reading their giant stat blocks. So I really appreciate this. I actually really like that picture of the Demi Lich. That's really cool. I really love the emphasis on choices and tactics and um, what your experience would be if you were in a fantasy world and you had to deal with something like this. We often we also have uh, encounters, these little write-ups of what it would be like to meet a creature like this. 
these uh, in this book all of the monsters are ranked by their their size so we're in medium creatures now uh, gnolls hobgoblins medusas every once in a while we'll come across a, a famous monster and they'll have a little write-up of them lycanthropes where bears where boars where rats where tigers and so on and so forth again with tactics and advice about what their layer is like what their special abilities are for every single one of them all described in world what this does is it reminds me a lot of the field guide to hot springs island which is another great book that i've reviewed previously and in that book that's like an in-world artifact that characters can pick up that describes the setting of the hot springs island now this isn't completely in world but it's almost a sort of thing that a character in a D&D universe could find lying around and read for themselves. It's right on the edge of being that. It's not quite there, but I'd say it's almost close enough. Some more monsters here. That's a great illustration right there. And we have the same basic deal here, where this one is all organized by locations. We have caverns and dark places first. This is a great picture of a beholder. Not, I mean, I'm not crazy about the art necessarily. It's a little bit cartoony, but just the way that it's designed and laid out here is just really excellent. We have the picture here. We have all of the different um, eye stalks have their own little description with arrows pointing to them. It's really wonderful. It's so visual. Bugbears and carrion crawlers and all of your other typical d, &D monsters. Uh, there's five books of these. The first four books do come in a uh, boxed set for $20. That's where you can get them for $5 a piece. Um, but they're really quite cheap. So you have some famous monsters, right? Like uh, our legendary vampire, Count Strahd. Dragon turtles, marrows, griffins. Uh, kids just love flipping through these books. Uh, my son also really likes looking through the official monster manual, but he just looks at the pictures there because he can't understand the stat blocks really. Um, but with these, he can actually read through them and get an understanding of what this monster is. So let's look at our next two books, which are focused on uh, warriors and weapons. And the other one is on wizards and spells for our spell casting uh, classes. We have our different fantasy races, all laid out with uh, headshots there, which is really nice. You can see it all on one page. Um, the commitment to visual design and making everything into charts or um, series of pictures like this where you can see all of the different things together is really great. Um, again, 5e doesn't really do that for some reason. So all of our different races have some questions here. Um, give, getting you to think about what this race is all about. Is this the type of race that you would like to play? Their age, their size, a nice write-up of them, and some attributes down there. Again, all described in non-game mechanic terms. It's far more immersive. So, for example, a dwarf is described as tough, handy, strong, and wise. Or an elf, for example, um, has grace as one of their attributes. Elves are dexterous in combat in combat as they are in dance. So if you were actually looking at the rule book, you would find that elves have a plus something to dexterity and that's gonna affect their combat bonus for ranged combat and so on and so forth. But writing it just like this, you don't think of it that way. You think of the elf in itself as a character in a world. And look how combat is placed on the same level as dance, for example. If you weren't reading the rules for D&D, &D, it would be pretty obvious to you that dance could be as effective as combat in the right circumstances. But because it's not really baked into the D&D &D rules, it's not really uh, conceptualized that way. So I really like how this keeps you in world. Half orcs, halflings, dragonborn, kenku, tabaxi, turtles. We have some of the races that aren't in the main um, player's handbook that came out in later books. And we get into our martial classes, barbarian, fighter, monk, paladin, ranger, and rogue. Each of these has their paths uh, that we find in the um, official manuals. And we have some equipment and attributes. What are they likely to be carrying? What sets them apart? Along with some famous legendary fighters, if you want to read up about them. One for each of the different classes. One really nice thing, a class flowchart, helping you to pick the class that you want to be. By running through the flowchart, you end up with a class that fits your play style. 
why doesn't 5e have something like this? There isn't a lot of information in the official books about how you choose uh, the right character for you, or the right class for you, or even which one's more difficult or which one's easier. Uh, this one really gives you more information and distinguishes them from each other in a clear manner. Some ideas for inspiration and background. How to make a character that uh, uh, you're set apart from other people with little details. Uh, clothes. What clothes are you wearing? What trinkets are you wearing? I love this section on weapons and equipment um, because it really gets you thinking about how you would use adventuring equipment to solve problems, which is, I think, often de-emphasized in 5e. At least that's the feeling I get. Um, things like encumbrance. People don't really pay that much attention to it. Whereas this book seems to emphasize it more. So this section at the back here, uh, the stuff that's in your pack, items for travel and exploration, you're going to be thinking about how much you can carry. It actually mentions stuff like that. You can't carry everything. You got to be careful and strategic with the gear that you're bringing on uh, your dungeon adventure. Along with what the different packs look like, so you can visualize what your character is carrying. We have stuff like with a picture of the lamp so we can see how it would actually work. This stuff allows you to get into the fiction more because you can start thinking of out-of-the-box ways to use your equipment when you can visualize it more clearly. Wizards and Spells. Getting into our magical classes. We have the same basic deal that we've seen before with our character classes right there. Bard and Druids and Sorcerers, Warlocks, Clerics, Wizards, and so on. We have a class flowchart for figuring out our magical class that we want to be. And we start getting into our spells, which occupy quite a bit of the book. We have our schools of magic here, all described with non-in-game terms, so without any um, actual mechanics. And we start getting into the types of spells. So I love the way that spells are laid out here. Um, so for example, we have things like um, Cure Wounds. It has a nice bold uh, font for you can see how the where the spell is what school it's from and it has spell tips so it talks about um, how the spell works and how it would affect the actual world so you get strategy tips that's really really great and again there's no game term so for example it says barkton doesn't have the weight or bulkiness of metal armor so it's a good temporary option for rogues rangers and other adventurers trying to stay uh, to sneak to sorry to stay sneaky um, have having rough bark skin can help you hide in a forest. That's something that you may not think about if you're just casting the normal spell, which just you know gives you an armor class bonus. These little details, which are important in world, are often missed when you're only thinking about mechanics. And this book actually emphasizes those. Most of our classic spells are all in here. I think some of them that are missing are things like fireball, which was a little unusual because that's such a classic, but most of the other classics are in here. Prismatic Spray, we get start getting into the really powerful ones at 8th level or ninth level. There's about 4 or so spells per level given as an example here. Uh, we get into some magical items, including some uh, unique magical items as well as more generic ones. There's a legendary weapon, the Sun Sword. What potions are going to look like, different types of rings and cloaks. Wondrous items, and thinking about how the magic is going to impact the world. And our final book, Dungeons and Tombs. This doesn't look at only Dungeons and Tombs, but also uh, settings and environments that you can find in the D&D world. So this is really the setting book. Preparing for your dungeon delve. I love how there's more of an assumption in this that you're going to be dungeoneering. You're going to be exploring dungeons. It's called Dungeons and Dragons, so that's a natural assumption. Although a lot of the 5e books don't seem to emphasize dungeons as much as uh, previous editions did. Each location has a um, basic rundown along with uh, important places that you would find there, each done with its own little paragraph. There can be a spotlight on one particular place some story prompts related to it, and an encounter that you could find while exploring the place, really helping you get in the headspace of what it would be like to explore these different worlds. We have Ravenloft, Cholt, 
under mountain. I really like this picture, by the way. I wish more um, adventures and more dungeon maps were done in a isometric style like this. And I love the cutaway aesthetic, although it's you, know, you can't really run an adventure from this picture. Something like that would be great for running dungeons. A dungeon bestiary. So we have even more monsters in this book, um, but these are focused on the type of stuff that you would find mostly underground in caves and in dungeons. Flame skulls, gibbering mouthers, and we have some classics like, ooh, so this one's really fun, the Iron Golem. When I think of Iron Golems, I think of something more like this, like a giant metal man with a big axe or something. So I love this picture of a horse and rider together being an Iron Golem. That's really neat. And again, it has this great do this, don't do this advice for how you would deal with such a uh, beast. Mimics, oozes, we've got some great stuff like gelatinous cubes. You got to have those in your dungeon. Great oozes, jellies, ropers. And a couple other more intelligent creatures that you could find down there. And what I love here is at the very end, we have a section on building your own dungeon. This is one of the first times that it really gets the reader involved in doing something D&D-like. In most of the other books, you're just you know taking in information about what this game or this setting is like. Uh, but here it's saying you can start making your own world right now with your own um, with a whole bunch of concrete advice. We start off with a general concept and location. Who built it? What was the purpose in creating it? How would you populate this place? What's the ecology like? What are the inhabitants? All the classic thought processes that you go through when making a dungeon. How do you actually make the map? Get out some graph paper. Here's how you draw the rooms. You want to connect them with hallways. You want to put some doors in there. You want to get some pillars. It even has a big key of map symbols for when you're drawing it yourself. This is a great way to get kids involved in making a dungeon. They're going to want to run it once they have one. So that's it for uh, this flip through of the Young Adventurer's Guides. Like I said, a really remarkable little gem of a book. It's pretty unique as far as I can tell in role-playing games to have something like this. Uh, great if you have your own kids or even as a gift for other people's kids. I'll put links down in the description below for where you can pick these up for yourself. Uh, very cheap, very well constructed, and a great way to introduce kids to role-playing and a great way to start these kind of thought experiments where you can read these books with them and think through what would you do if you saw a monster like that? What if you were this kind of character and holding these types of items and you were in this situation, what would you do? And then from there, they're going to want to jump into this whole hobby uh, full heartedly. So thanks for watching, everybody. And I'll see you guys next time.